uh, from all around the world to this DRTB training network introductory training course on clinical management for drug resistant tuberculosis, for which I am the course director. We would like to point out right away that all microphones have been muted, given the, the number of people who have joined and the potential for background noise, but rest assured you will have opportunity to ask the expert questions using the chat forum. We would also like to remind people that this webinar is being recorded. To give you some background information, the RTB network is a relatively new forum and it's aimed to offer doctors, nurses, clinical officers, public health managers, NGOs, donors, TB advocates to um, training tools and opportunities to self-learn, train others and disseminate information on the clinical and programmatic management of drug resistant tuberculosis. This online training course is one of the training opportunities available through the DRTB training network. The aim of the course is to provide doctors, nurses, clinical managers and officers working in resource limited settings with basic knowledge on how to initiate and treat MDRTB patients. The course consists of six webinars which will be delivered by the faculty of Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital and Parkinson Health. For the information, future courses will held and will explore in more in-depth components of clinical and programmatic management of TRTB, such as TB HIV co-infection, pediatric TB, uh, so role of community and social support, and other courses. Topics. As a course director, I have worked with to introduce you to Dr. Salman Keshavji. Dr. Keshavji is a director of the program in infection disease and social change at the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He worked extensively with PAGE, DRTB program in drug since 2000, and from 2006 to 2008, he was a deputy country director for PAH Lesotho Initiative, where they uh, started MDRTB HIV co infection program in Sub Saharan Africa. And starting in 2005, Dr. Keshavji represented PIH Harvard on the Green Light Committee as a Stop TB partnership and double show. From 2007 until September 2010, he was a uh, chair of the GLC. So through his role at Harvard, PIH, and the GLC, he has advised numerous TB programs around the world on the clinical and programmatic management of IMDR TB. So for now, I have a great pleasure to introduce Salman Kishavji and I would like to give a floor to Salman to start his presentation. Thank you, Alex, for the, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. So the, I, over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to discuss the, uh, the historical overview of drug-resistant tuberculosis. And as you can imagine, it's a very uh, long story. It takes a lot longer than 30 minutes. So I'm going to basically cut some corners and try and give the highlights. And the reason we've decided to start with a historical overview is because we feel that in understanding MDRTB, the way MDRTB has, has, has come to shape modern tuberculosis control, we really need to think of what's happened in tuberculosis control over the last 60 or 70 years. The history of TB has long been intertwined with modern medicine. Many of you will recall that, um, oh, hold on, you guys, I'm, there, that's it. Many of you will recall that, that uh, Robert Koch uh, discovered the tuberculosis bacillus in 1882. And when this was discovered, people were, were elated because they thought that this was going to herald the end of tuberculosis. You know, the idea was that if we could see the bacteria and properly diagnose it, we could develop means of controlling it, such as vaccines and, of course, uh, uh, eventually antibiotics. And we have to remember that historically, TB was the scourge of mankind. It, it uh, uh, was killing about 25% of the population of, of Europe at the, at the time that, that uh, Koch uh, discovered the bacillus. And although Koch actually won the Nobel Prize for his findings in 1905, it wasn't until 60 years later, until uh, uh, in the 1940s, that the first active antibiotic for tuberculosis was developed. So the first active antibiotic was streptomycin. And it was isolated in the lab of Salman Waxman, uh, by him and his graduate student, Albert Schatz, at Rutgers University in 1943. So that was about 60 years after, after uh, Koch had actually uh, discovered the bacillus. And Waxman sent crude streptomycin 
to colleagues Corwin Hinshaw and William Feldman at the Mayo Clinic in the United States. And they worked with, uh, with people from the pharmaceutical company. Um, well, they, they, they first demonstrated that the drug was active against mycobacterium tuberculosis. And then they worked with people from the pharmaceutical company Merck to make a really purified form. And in November of 1944, the first human tuberculosis patient received streptomycin and was cured of her disease. People were absolutely amazed. And this was followed by uh, another 10, sorry, another 100 patients. And then in 1948, the British Medical Research Council conducted the first large-scale clinical trial of streptomycin. Soon after the discovery of streptomycin, two new drugs came to the market. In 1948, thiacetazone and para aminosalicylic acid, PASS, were made. And when these were given with streptomycin, people noticed that there was, uh, there was uh, less antibiotic resistance, because, and I'll get, back, I'll get into that a little bit. In 1951, isonicotinic hydrazide, isoniazid, which we call INH, uh, was tested at Seaview Hospital in New York. And this drug was not a new drug. It had actually been described by others earlier, and it couldn't be patented. And when they used it against, uh, uh, against tuberculosis, it, it provided uh, dramatic results. And by 1952, isoniazid was being used for clinic, in clinical use. And then isoniazid was followed by the development of pyrazinamide in 1952, cyclosarine in 1952, ethionamide in 1956, rifampicin in 1957, even though it only came to be used clinically for tuberculosis in the late 1960s, and then ethambutol in 1962. And because of its high efficacy, rifampin, as many of you know, was a game changer for tuberculosis treatment. The first clinical trials of rifampin for tuberculosis began in the mid-1960s in Europe, and the first U.S. trial happened in 1969. In 1971, rifampicin was approved for use for TB treatment by the United States Food and Drug Administration. So when streptomycin was used in patients, the appearance of drug resistance was observed. This is, you know, when the first 100 patients were treated, drug resistance was observed. And they, they treated the 100 patients, and, and they noticed that, that they initially became better, and then they became sick with tuberculosis again. And then when isolates were taken from the patients, it was found that, uh, that these isolates were resistant to streptomycin. And this wasn't surprising, because as early as 1942, scientists like Rene Dubose had hypothesized that with the selection of bacterial populations that can result from the use of antibiotics, antibiotic resistance strains of bacteria would develop. So this presupposed the existence of some strains in every bacterial population that would be naturally resistant. The antibiotic would kill the sensitive strains, but leave those that were naturally resistant to grow. So in 1943, Salvador Luria and Max Delbruck, the two gentlemen pictured in the slide, demonstrated that random genetic muta mutations do occur even in the absence of selection. So they just are naturally occurring mutations. And that always creates a small amount of baseline drug resistance in any population. So the idea that if you gave an antibiotic, you would automatically have resistance because it would select out these naturally occurring resistant strains became the standard to scientific belief. And it's something that's actually held till today. And the history of tuberculosis therapeutics really, you know, if you look back over history, is the story of science's battle to understand and overcome micro microbial defenses against antibiotic therapy. So as I mentioned, if we let's just go through let's just go through a brief history of drug resistance so that we can see that very early on in the 1940s we knew about drug resistance and we knew about its presence and we knew that if we didn't treat the bacillus properly. It would, it, would, it would basically become more and more resistant. So from the moment that streptomycin was given, as I told you, in 1944, drug resistance was observed. The first, in the first 100 patients, it was found that there was a high relapse rate. Uh, when streptomycin was given with PASS, however, the phenomenon was markedly reduced. There was much less resistance. Immediately after isoniazid started being used, the... Um, uh, you, the, the, uh, uh, in clinical trial data, so actual clinical trial data showed that there was rapid generation of tuberculosis strains resistant to isonide, isonizide in patients receiving the drug alone. 
When isoniazid was given in combination with streptomycin, there appeared to be almost complete suppression of isoniazid resistance. So almost as soon as rifampicin was used, even under extremely controlled conditions in clinical trials, resistance to the drug was observed. So every time a new drug was used, resistance was observed. And that's the first major observation I think we can take from the history of, of uh, modern TB treatment is that TB drug resistance emerged with each new drug used and less resistance was observed when drugs were used in combination. So initially, it was believed that resistance would come at a cost to the virulence of a particular bacterial strain, a cost to bacterial fitness. And that because of this, not only would transmission of resistance strains be lower, but reversion to less resistance might occur in vivo. So that is that, that th those strains that were resistant wouldn't be as good as non-resistant strains in infecting their host and having a successful, uh, and causing disease successfully. But very early on, it was found that resistant strains from patients, so clinically relevant resistant strains, retained their ability to be transmitted to others. For example, in the early streptomycin studies, again, late 1940s, early 1950s, it was found that streptomycin resistant tuberculosis could be transmitted to other patients. Once drug resistant strains emerged among the retreatment cases, they soon were found among new patients. In fact, the first national drug resistance survey ever that was performed in the world was carried out by the British Medical Research Council among new tuberculosis patients in Britain between 1955 and 1956. And the survey found primary drug resistance to streptomycin to be 2.5% of the 974 cultures survey. So that's 2.5% resistance to streptomycin, 2.6% resistance to para-aminosalicylic acid, PAS, and 1.3% to isoniazid. So this was amongst patients who had never been infected with TB before. This was their first time that they were being infected, suggesting that resistance strains were actually circulating in the community. And we have to remember that this was only a handful of years after the use of these drugs had begun. So very early on, this was observed. And then in the United States, primary isoniazid resistance increased from 6.3% in the period between 1961 and 1964 to 9.7% in the period 1965 to 1968. And, even, and in the United States, between 1970 and 1990, there were a number of resistant tuberculosis outbreaks involving strains that were resistant to two or more drugs. So not even just single drug resistance, but resistant to more than one drug. And then people thought, well, you know, maybe in, once the bug infects people, there'll be a tendency to revert toward lower degrees of resistance or to sensitivity if you treated them properly. And again, that was found not to happen. And that was found by the, by the British Medical Research Council and their studies in Madras that patients who had acquired isoniazid resistance during treatment had persistent smear positivity and clinically deteriorated upon further treatment with the drug. So that means that you could not really count on drugs uh, for treatment uh, if the patient was resistant to those drugs. And as early as 1970, there was an outbreak of highly, highly virulent tuberculosis resistant to multiple drugs in New York City. And this was reported by Steiner in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and this, this, this outbreak was interesting. Uh, it, uh, uh, the index case died, and out of 28 contacts, 23 converted to being PPD positive, six contacts developed active drug-resistant disease, five of whom who were children. So this uh, outbreak, just for, as one example of many, uh, really showed that resistance, even to multiple drugs, didn't necessarily reduce bacterial fitness. Okay, the, the third important observation was that when patients were started on effective treatment, they became less infectious. Dr. Ed Nardell is going to talk to you more about this in the next lecture, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I do think it's worth mentioning the work of Richard Riley and colleagues who did a series of experiments exposing guinea pigs to air from the patient's room. And if you look at the left of your slide, you can see a, a schematic of Riley's uh, experimental TB ward where air from the patient's room was 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 uh, vented 
into a special chamber full of guinea pigs. And you can see from the table on the graph that if air was taken from the room of, patient, uh, room of, of patients with untreated drug susceptible tuberculosis, then 100% of the guinea pigs became infected with TB. If air was taken from the patient's room after they had all started treatment, only 2% of the guinea pigs was infected. So the suggestion was that if you started patients on proper treatment, you would actually end up having less transmission. So being treated appropriately reduced transmission of the disease, and the corollary of, corollary of course was that not being treated appropriately offered no apparent reduction in transmission. There was a similar reduction in the case of drug-resistant disease. This, of course, was an MDR-TB because when the study was done, there was no rifampicin being used and there was no short-course chemotherapy, so there was no MDR-TB. But it was just when you took drug-resistant strains, so presumably resistant to isoniazid, streptomycin, PASS, uh, you saw that treatment also reduced transmission of those strains. Now, Dr. Ed Nardell is an expert in this, and we'll tell you more about this in the next lecture in this series. But I just wanted to bring up this one slide uh, to, to, so you, that you can keep it in mind that people getting on correct treatment was very important. So from the earliest days, if we look historically, avoiding treatment failure and avoiding drug resistance became linked in the minds of tuberculosis clinicians. And given the overwhelming scientific evidence that the use of multi-drug regimens not only improved the probability of cure, but prevented both the generation and selection of resistant mutants, and it reduced transmission, the main question facing scientists was which combination and for how long. So in a series of carefully conducted clinical trials led by the British Medical Research Council and others over a number of decades in several countries, it was ultimately demonstrated that a four-drug regimen based on a backbone of isoniazid and rifampicin was highly effective, curing almost all patients who adhered to treatment, even after a relatively short period of six to eight months. And then added to this, and you'll hear about this later, in, in, uh, were, were, were studies demonstrating that home-based tuberculosis treatment was safe and highly effective when appropriately supervised. So thus, short-course chemotherapy became an option for treating tuberculosis, even in settings with limited health infrastructure. So why don't we stop there for quiz number one. As soon as the quiz question comes up, I'll read it to you, and then you'll have a chance to respond to it. So the question, drug-resistant tuberculosis is due to, one, rare but naturally occurring chromosomal mutations, two, selection due to the presence of antibiotics, three, small pieces of genetic material, plasmids, that pass from one mycobacterium to another. Four, choices one and two above, and five, all of the above. So please choose one, and we'll be able to tally. You can change your vote, of course, in the next few seconds, if you wish. Okay, well, I think we've given people a chance to respond for the most part. I know some of you are probably still choosing, but let's just go through the answers. Rare but naturally occurring chromosomal mutations. That is true. There are rare but naturally occurring chromosomal mutations. And as you'll hear later in the course, these mutations occur at a rate of about 1 over 10 to the 6 to 1 over 10 to the 9. <coughs> so if you think about it, in a given, in a given uh, cavity, there's probably about... 10 to the 9 bacteria, about a billion bacteria. So 
you depending on which resistance you're looking at you're probably going to have uh, one or two bugs resistant to isoniazid or rifampin etc now to have a drug I mean a, a bacteria resistant to both it would actually have to be the probability of the first event happening multiplied by the probability of the second event happening which is very rare but yes it is possible so a rare but naturally occurring chromosomal mutation is possible and true selection due to the presence of antibiotics that is correct when antibiotics are there they kill the other bacteria that are not uh, that are sensitive to the antibiotic and the few bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotic have the opportunity to grow now the host defense plays a role in controlling that but in certain situations for example in cavitary disease etc there is the opportunity for those bacteria to grow and you get selection due to the presence of antibiotics three so the, so, so number two is also correct number three small pieces of genetic material plasmids that pass from one mycobacterium to another so interestingly although a lot of bacterial uh, resistance is caused by plasmids genetic material that's passed from one bacteria to the other resistance in, in, in bacteria such as Staphylococcus aureus happened that way. This hasn't been observed in the case of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So three is actually not a correct answer for uh, resistance in tuberculosis. Four, choices one and two above. That's the correct answer because both one and two uh, are, are, are true. Okay. Let's go back to our, uh, our uh, presentation. So I want to diverge now from, from talking about the actual studies to what happened to tuberculosis in general in uh, uh, the kind of the, the, the post-prime antibiotic moment. Because I've just told you that in the 1950s and 60s, a number of antibiotics were developed. And a lot of these antibiotics were highly effective against tuberculosis. Yes, the treatment took long. It took about, uh, you know, it took six months or more initially before short-course chemotherapy was developed. But the, uh, but the treatment was effective. So if we look at global tuberculosis, we can really say that, that the economic and social forces really shaped the way we view the disease. After the oil shock of the 1970s, there was a, a, a lot of reduction in funding for global health. Poor countries became increasingly reliant on World Bank grant, grants and loans for their health needs. In Western countries, tuberculosis treatment had been fairly successful and tied to social and economic development, better housing, less overcrowding, low nutrition, tuberculosis rates had dropped markedly. So by the end of the, uh, 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 by the end of the, of the uh, uh, 19, uh, uh, seven, so, sorry, end of the 1960s, early 1970s, tuberculosis rates were so low that uh, there was very, very little need for large grants going for tuberculosis control, or so people perceived. And here is a, is a, a slide from, uh, that I borrowed from Dr. Ken Castro, the U.S. Centers of Disease, for Disease Control, that shows that the uh, categorical, categorical grants in the United States between 1972 to 1982 essentially ceased. And so you can see that TB funding uh, dropped markedly. Um, so let me jump back to the oil shock. So the oil shock caused you know, poor countries to become very reliant on World Bank grants and loans for their health needs. And in the 1980s, the World Bank's health agenda became increasingly defined by arguments of cost effectiveness. Now we've all heard about the ideas of cost effectiveness, but they really entered the, the discussions in, in health economics in the 1980s. And what, what it really meant, because it was linked to loans that were going to countries and, and, and their ability to pay them back, it really meant reducing state expenditures. And, and state expenditures in health were a, an area that was often targeted. So in 1978, the WHO hosted a conference on primary health care in Almaty, Kazakhstan, which at that, part, at that time was part of the Soviet Union. And at that meeting, delegates endorsed the concept of expanding access to primary health care for all of the world's population by the year 2000. And, and all of you have probably heard Health for All by the year 2000. 
<coughs> so while it was generally accepted that a comprehensive program of primary health care was optimal, the focus on cost led to an alternative, alternative idea, the idea of selective primary health care. And the Rockefeller Foundation hosted a conference on the idea, on the idea of selective primary health care for key leaders of global health at its meeting site in Bellagio, Italy. And one of the discussion papers for this meeting was later published as a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, which you see on the slide. And basically the argument of this paper by Julia Walsh and Kenneth Warren was that, you know, we don't have enough money to treat all diseases. And so we really have to prioritize what diseases we're going to treat with the money that we have. And so what they did is they, they, prioritized, they created priorities for disease control in the developing world based on the prevalence, mortality, morbidity, and feasibility of control. And high priority were diseases that didn't require a lot of, uh, uh, of building up of health systems that were very, you know, were reasonably easy to do, were high prevalent diseases with high mortality and high morbidity and for which there was a known and effective control. So diseases like diarrheal diseases, measles, uh, malaria, uh, neonatal tetanus, etc. And then tuberculosis, as you can see, I've circled it in red, was rated, was rated as medium priority. You know, high prevalence, high mortality, but difficult to control. And in fact, uh, for this category, sorry, for this category, the, the authors argued uh, these infections, which include Chagas disease, African trypanosomiasis, leprosy, and tuberculosis, may better be dealt with through an investment in research. So, you know, in a way, this was the death knell for tuberculosis in global health because people said, okay, we don't need to prior prioritize this. And at Bellagio, this approach uh, for selective primary health care won the support of the head of UNICEF, Jim Grant, and more significantly, the head of the World Bank at the time. <coughs> Robert McNamara and it and it really came to dominate the 1980s and the early 1990s and really shaped the way we did global health and despite extensive critique for being too vertical for not contributing to strengthening health health systems the idea of selective primary health care it offered a sense of simplicity and appeal to, do, to donors for tuberculosis as I mentioned though this was a major problem because what it meant is that Donors started focusing on selective primary health care, and uh, and it uh, and basically it, uh, did not really fund TB programs. So in the early 1990s, the World Bank began to calculate cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness using using a different metric, the Disability Adjusted Life Year or DALI. Now I'm not going to go into this metric very much, but because this metric accounted for the age at which a person became sick with the disease and it accounted for the morbidity of the disease suddenly treating TB with short course chemotherapy given under direct observation when we got to remember a disease TB was a disease which affected people at the prime of their economic and productive lives so suddenly treating TB with short course chemotherapy and direct observation became so much more desirable and in 1993 the World Bank produced the World Development Report, Investing in Health, and came out in support of short-course chemotherapy for tuberculosis as an extremely cost-effective strategy. And you can see that on a table from that very report, which I have on your screen, you, uh, you can see that, that it's actually one of the most cost-effective uh, strategies. Okay, so... The World Health Organization, seizing on this mo momentum, branded the idea uh, of, of using short course chemotherapy under observation as DOTS, direct observe directly observed therapy short course, <coughs> and began to successfully promote its adoption around the world. Most importantly, because it was packaged in a way similar to selective primary health care interventions, simple, easy, low cost, not requiring any, any strengthening of health systems, donors began to fund the program. And all of you know DOTS well. The program consisted of five areas, government commitment, case detection based on sputum smear microscopy, short course chemotherapy, a steady supply of first line drugs, and standardized recording and reporting. And so DOTS was packaged in a way that was palatable, palatable to the economic orthodoxy. And 
be, it, it, it had no extensive expensive in, inputs, so it didn't require laboratories or X-ray machines. And in some ways, it, it, it really glossed over uh, complications, such as identifying TB in children, identifying TB in people with HIV, identifying drug resistance, because obviously with sputum smear microscopy, you couldn't do that. And it set the tone for not investing in those elements of tuberculosis control that uh, <coughs> that required laboratories and special diagnostics. So, and D Dots did many good things. I think it's it's you know it's important to remember that. But we have to remember that Dots was introduced at a time where there was one major global tuberculosis problem, and that was that drug resistance was on the rise. And this time, it wasn't really just single drug resistance. It was MDRTB, strains of TB that were resistant to both isoniazid and rifampicin. So in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there were numerous outbreaks of MDRTB in the United States and around the world. The biggest one was in New York City. And the U.S. dealt with this epidemic decisively. Uh, they, you know, 1988, the epidemic more or less started. And you can see that they increased funding for tuberculosis and tuberculosis treatment and research markedly, as you can see from the graph on your screen. The U.S. also created a national action plan in 1992 to combat MDRTB. The experience in New York City, <coughs> which initially faced serious challenges, the, the city faced uh, serious challenges, provided really important lessons. First, it provided a blueprint of how to contain an epidemic of resistant tuberculosis. Diagnosis using mycobacterial culture, access to quality assured second line anti-TB medicines, proper infection control, and the delivery of care under direct observation. So basically, the entire template for how to treat MDRTB successfully and control an epidemic was known in 1992. Secondly, it demonstrated that transmission played a significant role in the spread of drug resistant TB. People initially thought that epidemics such as these were due only to sporadic pill taking that was selecting out you know, uh, uh, resistant strains. And of course, this played a role. But genetic analysis of strains from the US epidemics demonstrated the transmission of undetected and untreated strains played a really important role in propagating MDRTB. No surprise, because we knew that from Riley's studies in the 1960s. <coughs> so for example, a number of studies conducted by the US Centers for Disease Constro Control demonstrated that being in hospital put patients at a greater risk of tuberculosis. So here's an example, looking at four hospitals that the, in, in New York City and Miami that the United Center, State Centers for Disease Control studied. And you can see that the odds ratio uh, for, for acquiring, for, sorry, for getting uh, MDRTB for inpatients compared to patients who were outpatients, who were never in the hospital, was very high. And not just small risk, hospital A, 26-fold uh, risk. Hospital B, 36-fold risk. Hospital D, 42-fold risk. So very, very high. And then I'm not going to go into it too much because of time constraints, but uh, the, in the New York epidemic, uh, it also showed that HIV uh, uh, was, was played an important role in accelerating uh, the progression of the disease. So MDRTB was a harbinger of a much larger global epidemic. In the early to mid-1990s, MDRTB was observed in a number of global settings. In 1997, the first published WHO IUATLD uh, uh, report on anti-tuberculosis drug resistance was uh, published. And basically, it looked at 35 settings. And everywhere where TB was looked at, uh, it was observed. So despite extensive scientific data from 40 years of clinical trials, the contemporary evidence from the United States, data from the former Soviet Union that was showing that the exclusive use of DOTS was contributing to poor outcomes and unnecessary mortality. <clears throat> Despite all of that, there was a great resistance on the part of international policymakers to encourage the treatment of drug-resistant TB in poor countries and in high-burden TB countries. And really, people cited that it was too expensive and would detract attention from regular TB. The drugs were off-patent, but they were expensive because demand was low. Arguments were made that short course chemotherapy would be enough to bring the MDRTB control un uh, epidemic under control. And you can see that this is from a, a quote from 2002, so ar arguments were being made very late in the game. But we know from the historical studies 
even with eisenizid resistance, that if you continue to treat the uh, if you continue to treat the the uh, uh, um, if you continue to treat the uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, I hope everyone can hear me properly. If you continue to treat patients with eisenizid when they were resistant, we know that they had worse outcomes, and so saying that 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 MDRTB um, uh, would um, would be solved by short course chemotherapy really was a problem. Arguments were made that short course chemotherapy would be enough to bring it under control, and uh, and there was no provision in DOTS, of course, for second line drugs to be procured. Uh, there was little emphasis for building uh, 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 systems to deliver more complex health interventions, and so what happened is that people who were receiving DOTS, who became known as uh, 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 chronics, received no further care. Sometimes they were put on what was called a retreatment re regimen, where streptomycin was added to the first-line drug therapy, and I'm not going to go into that, but really, in some settings, that turned out to be disastrous. So, you know, the emphasis, in short, was put on doing good DOTS as a means of preventing MDRTB, as a means of, of turning off the tap. You guys, I think I'm having some transmission problems, so let me just check that everything is okay. <coughs> so Peter Sigelski wrote a, uh, a journal, uh, an article in the journal Clinical Infectious Disease in, in 2010, and he really outlines how things changed globally, historically. He said that leadership around MDRTB came from a collaborative partnership between countries affected by non-government uh, affected and non-governmental organizations, especially humanitarian and non-profit organizations, academic institutions, and philanthropies played a very big role in changing the history of MDRTB. So Peru became one of the early sites for debate about MDRTB, about whether it should be treated in poor countries. <coughs> and many of you know the Boston-based NGO Partners in Health discovered an outbreak in Peru and immediately began using the New York City template, you know, altered for community-based delivery in Peru and had good results. And this led to a lot of debate. And in 1998, there was a major policy meeting in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where a lot of global policymakers were brought together. And this led to the idea of DOTS Plus, a framework where, you know, DOTS would be built upon uh, for, uh, to treat MDRTB. And the projects that were currently treating MDRTB in the world would become DOTS plus pilot projects. And this was accompanied simultaneously with the creation of something called the Green Light Committee mechanism. And in this, uh, this mechanism, Dr. Jim Kim and others at Harvard and Partners in Health, working with Médecins Sans Frontières, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the Task Force for Child Survival, the World Health Organization, and other international partners, brought together a group <coughs> to, to make second-line drugs available to patients in resource-poor settings. And this coincided with a grant received from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to, uh, uh, to help push a change in MDRTB policy. And the WHO was given money from this grant to create a policy framework for the programmatic management of drug-resistant TB. And in 2006, after 18 years after New York City and 14 years after the United States put out its national guidelines for managing drug-resistant TB, MDRTB was finally uh, uh, included in the global stop TB strategy. So I have to wrap up, but let me quickly say, go through where are we today with drug-resistant tuberculosis, just so that we can come up to the, the current era. So the GLC system, if we look at a 10-year picture, and this is between um, uh, 2000 and 2009, you can see that there were about 5 million cases treated. 0.5% <coughs> of the patients were treated in GLC-approved programs. That's, that's about 50,000. 3.5 million patients in that period, roughly, had no treatment reported. So they some probably obtained treatment whose quality was unknown. Many of them continued to transmit. Some of them probably died. And according to the WHO statistics, 1.5 million patients died. So really, we, we gave proper treatment to very few people. The drug prices have increased and are too much for some countries. This is a chart from, uh, from the International Union uh, and from MSF uh, 
from a book that they put out in 2011 that shows that the price for drugs went up markedly. 990% for amikacin, 600% for canamycin. So the drugs remain unaffordable. The cost of drugs uh, as a percentage of gross national income, if you look, uh, it's very hard to see this because it's a busy graph, but this is from the WHO a surveillance, uh, 2010 Global Surveillance and Response uh, 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 book. You can see that for some countries, the cost of treating drug-resistant TB is more than 100% of their gross national income. And countries like DR Congo, it's 2,000% of their gross national income. <coughs> Many countries don't have the capacity to treat the high burden of drug-resistant TB. Most of the countries that, are, that have MDR-TB are very weak in their health, overall health system performance. They don't have laboratory infrastructure and the population is poor so unless money is put in to build up that infrastructure and systems are put in place you actually can't have the local population sustain it on their own there is limited capacity to diagnose patients with drug resistance if you look at these these uh, statistics from the WHO the percentage of new cases tested is highest in the euro region but even there it's only about 30 percent the percentage of new cases tested in Africa in the Middle East in Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific is phenomenally low and in total in the world it's less than 10% and you can see very similar statistics for retreatment patients and then the disease continues to spread in every settings here is a, 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 a piece from the European Respiratory Journal in October of 2010 talking about the situation in Minsk in Belarus and it says that multi-drug resistant tuberculosis was found in 35% of new patients and 76.5% of those previously treated. And extensively drug-resistant TB, so very, very broad spectrum resistance, was found in 15 of the 107 multi-drug-resistant TB patients, so that's 14%. And patients under 35 had a two times higher odds of MDR-TB than those older. So really affecting people really at the prime of their lives. And if you look at XDR-TB, and you can look at this graph, the areas in gray, are places that have reported at least one XDR TB case. You can see that most of the world has this broad spectrum resistance. So I wish I could end on a positive note. Uh, historically, we're at a place where uh, I think the positive aspect is that the disease is treatable, systems exist, but we're at a historical juncture where we have a lot of knowledge. We'd have a lot. We've had a lot of knowledge for 60 years, but the critical pieces have not fallen into place, both at the local level and at the international level. I'm out of time, so we're going to we're going to skip uh, quiz number 2 and go straight to questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much very much. Um, so now we have uh, about 10 questions uh, I selected and you have you see right now in the question and answer poll that only host can see so Someone you can start um, answering, reading and answering your questions as you feel comfortable. Okay, so one of the questions that somebody wrote is why is streptomycin resistance so uncommon with the use of, uh, of uh, combination drugs? <coughs> well, as, as we went through, if you use multiple drugs, basically what you're doing is that you're covering the uh, possibility that people uh, that, that there'll be uh, naturally occurring resistant strains that would be s selected. So if you use three or four drugs, you bring down the, the, uh, the uh, uh, selection of any of these one drugs to a very, very low level. And then the other drug actually kills it. So streptomycin resistance is uncommon when used in combination with other drugs uh, because basically it's part of a three or four drug regimen and, and, and it's protected. It's protected by the other drugs. Now the reason we see very high streptomycin resistance in the world is that in the 1990s uh, uh, an approach to, to treating patients who failed first-line treatment was developed called a retreatment regimen. Some of you know this as a category 2 regimen. And what this regimen said was if you have a patient who, fa who fails uh, first-line therapy, all you need to do is add is add a second line therapy, uh, sorry, all you need to do is add uh, first line therapy again with the addition of the drug streptomycin. So in an ideal situation, five people, sorry, five drugs would be, uh, would be being used, which would be fantastic. Uh, 
right? Because you'd use streptomycin plus the four original drugs. <coughs> However, you can imagine a situation where if a person was resistant to isoniazid or rifampicin and you added streptomycin in category two, you basically have uh, streptomycin plus two of the weaker drugs being used. And so you end up getting streptomycin resistant. So some countries, places like the Russian Federation and places in the former Soviet Union, you see streptomycin resistance in drug resistant patients of 100%. And you see general streptomycin resistance you know, in the 50 or 60% range. And then also drugs like streptomycin have been used for a number of other diseases like brucellosis, et cetera. So these drugs uh, you know, uh, are, are, are often uh, used, quote unquote, unprotected, and it selects out resistance. I hope that answered the question. So the next question is, how bad is it to keep two or more MDR patients with different DST patterns in one room? So Dr. Ed Nardell is going to talk about that next week, but let me answer that question. We know that patients with tuberculosis can be, uh, can, can actually be, uh, <clears throat> can actually uh, be reinfected with different strains of tuberculosis. So tuberculosis, infection with tuberculosis does not in itself provide uh, protection against further reinfection. So if you treat a patient who has one strain with certain antibiotics, but they're exposed to bacteria that has another antibiotic resistance pattern, they can be infected with that bacteria, with that different resistance pattern, and if the antibiotics that they're on do not cover, uh, do not cover the uh, resistance pattern, the second resistance pattern, they will actually get infection with that disease. So that is why patients sometimes in hospital get infected with other strains of tuberculosis than what they've come into. And this was shown in a study by Gelmanova uh, in uh, the Russian Federation, where looking at a hospital where patients came in for regular TB. Uh, it turned out that the biggest risk factor for acquiring MDRTB was coming in and being hospitalized for regular TB. And the reason was because patients with regular TB and MDRTB were kept in the same area. They were all put on first line therapy. The people who had regular TB, of course, were treated. The people who had drug resistant TB were not. Those strains were in the air and they infected the other patients. So exactly what we saw in Riley's experiment with the guinea pigs, we actually ended up seeing epidemiologically in Gelmanova's study with real patients. Are there any examples in the world where drug-resistant disease has been treated and rates have gone down? I'm referring especially to poor countries. Okay, well, there are some examples. Uh, so in rich countries, of course, we've seen drug resistance go down in the United States and places like Hong Kong, etc. In poor countries, we actually have seen the rates go down as well. In one of the recent WHO TB publications, there's some really some interesting graphs where, and I'm going to take the example from the Russian Federation. Uh, <coughs> there, there are some graphs that show the situation in Ariol and Tomsk, which are two of the provinces in Russia which have been treating MDR TB for more or less the last 10 years. And you can see that um, if you look at these graphs, you can actually see that around the point that these provinces started treating all their MDRTB patients. So in the case of Tomsk, it was 2004. You can see that MDRTB starts going down uh, in general, and MDRTB as a proportion of all TB starts going down. And so this suggests that if you actually treat MDRTB, and you actually treat as many of the cases as you can, so not just 50 or 100, but all of them, all of them that you can find, you're in, in essence reducing the reservoir of people that are out there transmitting it. Now we don't know what the true reservoir is, but you're you're you know by treating as many people as you can, you're reducing the number of people that are actually going to be transmitting the disease. And again, this fits the data that we saw in the 1950s and the 1960s quite well. Um, Let me just, uh, is, uh, is streptomycin still being used as a first-line antibiotic? The answer is yes. In some cases, streptomycin is being used as a first-line antibiotic, especially for retreatment of patients. Now, the Category 2 regimen, let me jump back to that. Theoretically, if a patient was not resistant to any drugs, 
they just had, had not taken their medicines, and you put them on category two, which is five drugs, you would imagine that they would be cured. So in and of itself, the idea of using five drugs to treat a patient is not a bad idea. The problem is that with high rates of drug resistance around the world, especially among retreatment cases, adding one drug to what could be a failing regimen is dangerous. So you can use streptomycin as a first-line antibiotic <coughs> if you check the DST of these patients and make sure that they're not resistant to isoniazid, rifampicin, uh, and ethambutol or perizinamide. So to answer the question, streptomycin is still being used as a first-line antibiotic. It's being used in a dangerous way in some settings, uh, and in other settings it could be used appropriately. Is there any relationship between MDRTB and HIV? Well, as you know, HIV patients are more, uh, more uh, um, uh, prone to getting TB, and the reason is because T cells play an important role in sequestering TB infection so that people don't get active t disease. And often when the TB is, is sequestered in what we call latent disease, it requires functioning T cells to keep it in its latent stage. So in actual fact, if you have dysfunctional T cells, you're more likely to get tuberculosis. Untreated HIV also exposes people to different absorption problems, etc. And studies in other parts of the world, such as South Africa, show that in patients with untreated HIV who often have uh, uh, bowel infections and, and have trouble absorbing drugs, you see uh, subtherapeutic uh, concentrations of rifampicin and isoniazid. And these absorption problems sometimes contribute to the development of resistance because the patients are not receiving an appropriate regimen inadvertently because of these absorption issues. So you often see, uh, uh, you can see MDRTB developing in this population. So when we think of places where MDRTB is a major problem, uh, especially places with high HIV, you can see that there's two things driving it. One is potentially the development of MDRTB in these patients, and secondly, because these patients are very prone to infection with TB, including MDRTB. Uh, okay, another question. Why all the MDRTB that cannot be cured? Well, study after study has shown that if you actually treat MDRTB, you get a cure rate somewhere between 65 and 80 percent in a good, in a well-functioning uh, program. And some studies have shown that if you actually treat even XDRTB with, you know, high dose uh, uh, of fluoroquinolones and 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 and, and uh, 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 third-line drugs. Uh, and, and you're very aggressive about your regimens, you can actually get cure rates between 45 and even 65 percent. So MDRTB can be cured. The reason MDRTB is not cured <coughs> is because we actually haven't built programs around the world capable of doing it. Countries were told essentially until 2006 to really not even build laboratories or focus on the health infrastructure required to treat uh, TB. In 2006, that message changed, and here we are six years later, and a lot of countries, large countries like India, etc., are starting their treatment programs. They're building laboratory infrastructure. But the delay between 1992, when the U.S. put out its standard of care, and Europe put out its standard of care, and Canada put out its standard of care, to the message being given to countries which had the highest burdens of TB in 2006 onward, that delay has resulted directly in us not having the infrastructure in place to treat the diseases and then not, not having enough investment put in place to treat the diseases. The other thing is that countries have weak health systems. This isn't something that can happen overnight. It really requires a very, very targeted assistance to help uh, countries develop the systems to treat TB. You need laboratory systems, you need transportation systems, you need drug management systems, you need to be able to manage adverse events. You need hospitals for very sick patients. You need ambulatory systems to treat people in the community. So these are very, very complex uh, problems. And right now, what's happened is that people have received manuals and trainings, etc. But it would be as if we were to build something very complex, like a, 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 a nuclear power plant or a Boeing 747, and we were just to mail people the plans, and we were to just mail them guidelines and send them to training courses. Even when a, a developed country like the United States builds a nuclear energy plant, what they do is that 
the company sent people for years to work and train and manage the plant to make sure that the infrastructure is in place. So I think one of the major problems of why we haven't been able to cure MDRTB is because we haven't put the right type of technical assist assistance and infrastructural building assistance in place to make this happen. And and this is this has been despite the fact that global fund funding has been there. Um, so next question, you've shown that many high burden countries do not have good health systems, yet there have been some global MDRTB treatment successes. What has been the international experience in building success, successful programs in poorer countries? Well, there have been successes. <clears throat> and if you look, Manila, Philippines, uh, Estonia, uh, Tom, uh, Tomsk I mentioned to you, Latvia, uh, uh, Nepal, Peru, you, there are a number of examples and a lot of these examples actually had the assistance of people in, uh, uh, had the, the, the experience of, of, of people in, um, uh, in aid agencies and in technical assistance agencies really putting boots on the ground and working with countries to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, build the infrastructure required to deliver MDRTB care. You guys, there's a lot of other questions, but unfortunately, we're at the end of the time. I really appreciate everyone's questions and the participation, uh, and, and thank you for being such, uh, such, such good uh, 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 webinar participants. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Saman, very much. Um, so this brings our first webinar introduction to MDRTB clinical management to an end and I would like to sincerely thank Dr. Keshavji for a very informative and interesting webinar and I would also like to thank you all for your participation. I hope you all agree that it was very enjoyable. As mentioned you will receive an email from the DRTB training network team with a link to the recorded webinar presentation and writing materials and a link to the DRTB training network as well as our contact details. Kiva Additionally, we'll be in touch uh, soliciting your feedback. So on behalf of the JTB Training Network, uh, goodbye and thank you very much.